So they did abandon the spies protecting spies conflict from the first film for a tad more generic save the world one, but at least Nagorovich gets some epidemic shadowing. I suppose I'm a bit anxious. You'll soon be with old friends. Risky move to reintroduce our main character by having him throw veiled threats around like this. I must arrive at my destination within 20 hours of departure. After you've been infected with Chimera for 20 hours, nothing can save you. That seems like such a dead giveaway that he infected himself. But who seriously would ever assume he'd do that? Plus, no way of knowing how much information IMF gave Sean. Are you concerned? Not so far. Tom Cruise pretending to be a villain who is pretending to be him. You keep calling me Dimitri. You really shouldn't. It's also such a great bait and switch to the audience since we know Ethan's not really Dimitri. It works so well, it's misdirection. Holy crap. Do you recognize Ulrich? I'll, I'll give you a second. You know him with less hair. He likes breaking. Out of prisons. Time's up. Mind blown. Another quick, super fun cold open for the Mission Impossible series that again plays a part in the larger story going forward. A good reminder that nothing is ever as it seems, the villains are as ruthless as ever, and Tom Cruise looks pretty with long hair. All ending in a sweet transition explosion in some mountains to some other mountains. Tom Cruise did the majority of this climbing himself, and his certifiable dedication to realism is why Tom Cruise is always a win. I know for a fact that Tom did that jump about eight times to get that shot right with no nets, nothing below him at all except 2,000 feet of death and one safety cable. Dude is devoted. And it's not his fault he didn't have a rocketed boot Spock to save him. Hey, mister, see that sister? Don't you let that fail you? So of all the weird things that happened in this film, this song choice has always really confused me. But I think I get it now. Ethan's entire life is one crazy impossible mission on the edge of a death knife at all times. Ah, death knife. So, free climbing up some mountain without anyone shooting at you is like a walk in the park. Thus, playful music. I remember being totally stoked the first time I heard this track in the trailer. And as a shift away from De Palma's film, it works. As bizarre as the amount of slow motion dancing there is in this scene, I like the world slows, love at first sight moment between these two. Not a lot of time for them to fall in love, so seeing women's dresses fall out of time before your very eyes would make you fall hard. And then Naya using the stomping to move around undetected is pretty resourceful. Do you mind if I'm on top? Well, either way works for me. Flirting. You'd think Maeve would just be able to plug herself in and unlock everything. Probably doesn't look like anything to her. Bulgari, the brand of rogue IMF agents and Spanish rich people. What are you trying to do, senorita? Rob me? The thought had crossed my mind. Honesty. I love that it's all just fun. La di da, we're cruising down a windy road in our convertibles, having a quaint little conversation, then bang! Naya gets real because she don't like people playing on her phone. And one of my favorite things about Tom Cruise is his ability to do crazy, unbelievable things, but acknowledge that they're crazy with a little look as he straps himself in. Sorry. Politeness. Idiota. Sorry. And more politeness. Saving a new love interest with a fender bump. And then saving her again with a little callback sexy Spanish car dancing. To anyone that likes to point out how unrealistic it is for Ethan to save her by spinning around with her, yeah, duh, it wasn't the plan. They both almost died. Part of being a spy is having really good luck. And to anyone else complaining that they fell in love too fast, I'd like to see you almost die and then get saved by Tom Cruise slash save Tandy Newton's life and not fall in love. Adrenaline endorphins, chemically I think they're bonded for life now. Pay no attention to that moving forward in the series. Tom Cruise's workout routine. Damn you, beautiful. <sighs> Compliment? Compliment. Compliments. Espresso? Cappuccino? Ah, so IMF listened to Ethan's request from the first movie. Can we get a cappuccino machine in here? I'm sorry I didn't let you know where I was. Dumpy wouldn't be vacation if you did. That's cute. Like Swanbeck put this line. The next time you go on holiday, please be good enough to let us know where you're going. In the recording because it was an official IMF communication. Gotta keep on the up and up, you know? But to go to bed with a man and light him, she's a woman. She's got all the training she needs. Well, Ford, you programmed Maeve that way. I've always liked Zimmer's score for this film, even if the main through piece always reminded me of DMB's two-step, but hearing how much John Woo tries to time his edit to the score made me appreciate it even more. This wasn't what I had in mind, I... But it is what you'd like me to do. You think to yourself, just explain to her that it's not what you thought you needed her for. But then she's right. He still does need her to do it. I love the switch when she accepts that he really doesn't want her to, and she starts offering ideas like it's just a job. Oh, that I needed him in some urgent way. G'day, mate, I'm William Baird, but Billy's okay. Anything you need me to get, move or watch, just let me know I'm your man. I'll have a look around. <laughs> <laughs> I 
off a crazy Aussie. I thought I had to ease up on you guys after the Death Cure teaser, so maybe this one was a little too easy, but this modern looking villain lair house on the water is a win even two decades later. Whoever thought a slow motion scarf grab could be so tense? Whoa, you minx you. I'm dying to see if I remember your size. So, this is interesting. She's a thief, not a spy. She hasn't been trained for this. I think her giving in so willingly probably made Ambrose even more suspicious. I think Nikorvich created a monster virus in Chimera. The antivirus to kill it in Bellerophon. That's simple, huh? Why not? That's what you get when you complain about a movie being convoluted. Roger <coughs> Ebert. Your characters just spell everything out so there's no confusion, even if it's information you already have. No offense to this movie, though. They gave the fans what they asked for. Less confusion. Or don't you think I can learn more from her than she can from me? Confirmation that he pretty much already knows, which is exactly how it should be. Number one, he's a spy, so of course he's gonna play along to find out what's going on. And number two, a liar always suspects people of lying. And this is one of the most tense sequences in the entire series. Now I said I could have sworn there was a scene of Krieger biting the rat to death. Yeah, I think I was actually thinking of this. Something you'd totally expect to be off screen. Perfectly executed sleight of hand. So where's the loo? <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> it's funny because Richard Roxburgh is pretending to be a South African making fun of Australians' overuse of mate, but he's actually an Aussie. <clears throat> Awkward teamwork. Again, just a thief, no match for a spy. I do love this entire scene either way. The suspense of the background deals and fear of getting caught, the love triangle, Ambrose still unsure about Naya and Ethan trying to protect her, probably already regretting putting her in harm's way. So this little clip makes this totally surprising if you're paying attention. And none of it's a cheat. Let's run it down. Ambrose says, We've got an opportunity here. I'm not going to miss it. And then we cut to McCloy, who you assume is the opportunity. And we see henchman number three watching McCloy. So then interplaying Ethan grabbing Naya with what you assume is Ambrose's operation trying to dupe McCloy, this takes you off guard. You were right. Hunt stung McCloy tonight. And that's why Ambrose's goon was watching McCloy. Article is what it says it's about. They even stagger the repeating paragraphs. And as much of a tough guy finger snipper Ambrose is, I like that he's still vulnerable and was genuinely hurt by Naya's betrayal. He'll undoubtedly engage in some erotic insanity before he'll risk harming a hair on a security guard's head. Lampshading <laughs> the first film while excusing the awesomeness to come. Also, thank goodness Ethan doesn't like hurting people because that's why we get this awesomeness. Dang, Tom Cruise in a wire never gets old. Ethan Hunt plus danger plus suspended precariously from rope equals win. Superhero Landing's little brother, the Ninja Landing. I'm betting Hunt will destroy Chimera rather than attempt to preserve any part of it. Adding to the meta commentary standing opposite the first movie, I love that Ambrose dictates Hunt's entire plan, making Ambrose the one ahead of the curve this time. What can we do? Hope he kills all the bugs before the yellow dot gets to the red one. <laughs> Listen, Mr. Wu, some of us like the complex stories and plans, but that, that works too. Also, Ethan gets to show off his action star commando skills. What? There's no reason to think a super spy like Ethan Hunt wouldn't have sliding along the floor anti-stormtrooper aim. You know, that was the hardest part of having to betray you. Grinning like an idiot every 15 minutes. See, another reason I respect Tom Cruise. You know he got final say on jokes like that, meaning he's willing to self-deprecate for comedy. The very thing you came for. <laughs> Love that Hunt instigates the shooting again, since there's no risk from his gun. And in his mind, they shoot the injection gun, they all die, movie over. He doesn't know about Naya yet. Naya's in the building. Luther's alive. Oh, right. They, they tried to blow him up. Like monkeys they are. Won't let go of one branch till they get a grip on the next. I'm starting to think Robert Town and John Woo hate women. But to go to bed with a man and lie to him, she's a woman. She's got all the training she needs. Or maybe just Tandy Newton. She's basically a punching bag for bad jokes and unwanted come-ons. In addition to, again, sounding very two-steppy. Do you think Lisa Gerard, the woman who sang for this song, as well as the very similar sounding piece in Gladiator, questioned Zimmer about the similarities? I mean, she had to have recorded them within months of each other. Lisa Gerard's voice is a win either way. Potential self-sacrifice. You know you don't have a choice. Just do it. And even more potential self-sacrifice. Say what you will about this crazy action sequence. Wu knows how to shoot some dramatic slow motion moments. Also, let's be honest, Tom Cruise sprints like a champ. Also, yep. You can be assured of going down in history as a typhoid Mary of Oz. Yeah, at least you'll get your own wiki. I appreciate that they showed us the biocide storage facility earlier. Tying it all together. 
Speaking of which, I knew he could put that rock climbing to use. Ethan has some more spy stuff to come, and he's done some sweet gunfighting with a few acrobatics before this point, but that kick signals the start of Rampage Ethan for a lack of a less Archer reference. And I love it! And just when you think he's gonna break that zero body count rule, it was just a little confusion spin. Somewhere in Sydney, get a heart in the target. You mean like this? I'll be the first to admit that John Woo's pigeon obsession is a little strange, but I don't hate how he uses them to signal that something is about to happen. Whether it's a bicycle kick to the face, I love the ghost of Bruce Lee from No Retreat, No Surrender. Ooh, deep cut. You heard me. Favorite movie from age 8 to 12 slash 32, or just Tommy Boy crashing into someone. Pipe bomb ding dong ditch. Or is this more of a flaming bag of poop? Somewhere in the middle, I think. <laughs> no amount of self-awareness or satire could make this not work. The white dove, the flames reflected in Ambrose's eyes. <laughs> I'm not sure if it makes doves cry or just prints beyond the grave. Also, badass good guy. <laughs> What's the dirty look Ethan gives the dove? Sean, this rat's reached the end of the maze. I'm starting to wonder if Tom Cruise was the one who asked you to do a South African accent just so that he could show off his in the end. Ooh, that look of desperation is actually a little haunting. Poor Hugh. This Shakespearean switcheroo treated with all the appropriate gravity tricking our enemy into murdering his best friend and confidant should be giving way to this. Good stuff. Let's not get slogged down with how messed up that is. Let's get some HK going. Glad to see it only took Ethan... Oh my gosh, 18 years? To be a little bolder when it comes to grabbing a chopper. Tom Cruise does look good in a motorcycle. <laughs> Cliche or not, yup, right? Nothing cliche about a strategically done Endo. And then Endo transitioned to gas tank blow up? Again, it's not just Tom Cruise on a motorcycle. It's Ethan Hunt smoking out his tail so that he can blind them to the tractor trailer that's about to incinerate them. C, dodging bullets in the most realistic and practical way possible. You just can't knock the way John Woo and Jeffrey Kimball shoot action. More importantly, Ethan Hunt plus hanging on exterior of high speed moving vehicle equals win. And a no look shot for good measure. I know who's looking in the mirror. Still counts. Who would have thought sport bike fighting would be so fun to watch? Say what you will about this movie as a whole, the entire motorcycle chase and fight scene is fantastic. Never just reduced to riding, always shooting, doing creative things. And liquid organs. Or at best, shattered skeletons. But rule of cool always applies to games of chicken. Now John really starts to honor his Hong Kong roots with a highly choreographed to the drums brawl between these two, even letting Ethan do his best Bruce Lee impression. Just goes to show how many different martial arts Tom Cruise has learned over the years. This grappling and arm lock Brazilian Jiu Jitsu slash Aikido stuff is completely different from his Jack Reacher Casey fighting method. File that under unnecessary risks taken by Tom Cruise due to his unimpeded devotion to realism. That will not be the last time we have that type of win in this series. That's a real knife. That's his real eye. Scott put his full force against it and it was only stopped by a cable attached to the end. Feel free to add Tom Cruise driving through this fire as well. All real. And that sheer will to overpower is so satisfying. File that under Ethan Hunt would rather throw the weapon at your feet than specifically use it to kill you. Though I'm cool with him kicking the snot out of Ambrose anyway. More yup, yep, and yup. Was that a cartwheel kick? Ethan knows Capoeira too? You should have killed me. It is one of his moral flaws, but it leads to a gun chip. So there's that, physics be damned. In general, I just like that Ethan goes out of his way to not kill anyone unless he absolutely has to. But you were under specific instructions, Mr. Hunt, to bring back a living sample. Oh, after you'd managed this recovery, it subsequently got destroyed. By fire. It's the best way, really. And so starts Ethan Hunt's long history of purposefully disappointing the brass. The thing with Kittridge doesn't count. Like you, he didn't know what was going on. Let's get lost. And Naya was never seen or heard from again. Must have taken getting lost a little too literally. I'm sorry, I just, there's just no excuse. 
I always really like this movie. I realize I'm in the minority with critics and audiences alike, as it's currently sitting at a 57% and a 42% respectively. And even at a younger age, it wasn't quite on par with the first one, and that's been confirmed for me. But to be reductive, it's comparing apples to oranges. For the record, I mentioned Roger Ebert's review of Mission Impossible 1 and how he thought it was confusing. He called MI2 a much better movie than the first in the series. Do with that what you will. But Tom Cruise specifically sought out John Woo because he wanted it to be completely different. Woo made an action film inside a Mission Impossible skin. It honestly would have been less surprising if this was the fourth or fifth installment, dated early aughts style and music aside. He kind of just used the Cruise appeal from the first one to show off some fun action set pieces. And that's not even really an insult, it's, it's just a fact. Tom Cruise and John Woo designed the action set pieces before even having a script. So, don't get me wrong, they're extremely fun, so no harm no foul. Other than that, some of the dialogue can be a little stilted or a little too hammy. Sometimes I picture Harold Zoid behind the camera yelling, EMOTE, as they start the 43rd take on this scene. And Scott's accent has something of a mustache twirly cadence, but the way the movie is, it all works towards bettering the experience. I mentioned in my first movie's review that Ethan Hunt is still Ethan Hunt throughout the series. I'll admit this is the most out there he gets, long hair and all. He's upgraded his martial arts a little, but he's still getting by on the seat of his pants and acknowledging it, even as skilled as he is. And as goofy as some of the action is, Tom Cruise clearly committed to every bit of it. Tandy Newton is treated a little like a prop, but she does well with what she's given and keeps some sense of agency here and there. It's maybe a little obvious, but in addition to the spelled out virus antidote meaning behind Bellerophon and Chimera, Ethan and Sean also embody the myth as two different versions of basically the same thing, both IMF spies with totally different methods and mythos. Wu isn't one for subtext anyway, he likes to spell it out. So while the film buffs in my audience are currently screaming that I haven't mentioned Notorious yet and how similar this plot is, John Woo's style of filmmaking is still distinct. From his Hong Kong slow motion to the dolly dynamic and crash zooms to muting audio during a gunfight. I mean, this. This awesomeness is a testament to John Woo's action directing chops. Always clear geography of who's shooting at whom and from where. Perfectly timed cuts and usage of slow motion. It's always so easy to understand and fun to watch. And he also gives us some interesting visual flares as well, like the reflection in these sunglasses and the screen wipe with the dancers. It's one of those movies you can enjoy a lot more if you know what it is going into it. Don't expect Brian De Palma's MI2, it's not that. And regardless of your feelings about this particular sequel, thank goodness it made all the money because they just get better from here. Next week, one of those you've been begging for, but I get the feeling you're all already writing your angry comments. Prepare yourselves for everything great about next week's comment section. We need to be difficult. Very. Well, this is not mission difficult, Mr. Hunt, it's mission impossible. Difficult to be a walk in the park for you.